And today I'm excited because we start a brand new series titled Deadly Relationships. Now, me saying that, you may think that's a little weird, okay? In fact, looking at this set, you may be thinking, this looks a little weird. What kind of church did I arrive at today? But the reason why I want to bring this to your attention is because with this series, I'm going to teach you that there are deadly habits right now in your life that are killing off your relationships. Because the truth is, according to the word of God, relationships should be a blessing to your life. In fact, you are called to be a blessing to others. But this may look a little weird or a little bit scary, but let me tell you what's more frightening. What our culture today says is a healthy relationship. That is more frightening to me. And so people don't understand that they've allowed some things into their life that are completely destroying your relationships. So what habits right now are in your life that are destroying the good things that you love? Maybe there are some habits that you need to change in order to save your marriage. Maybe there's some habits right now you need to change to have better friendships. Maybe there are some habits right now in your life that are holding you back from getting closer to God. What habits are you holding on to? So to understand this, I want to dive deep into the very beginning to understand why did God create us in the first place to need relationships in our life. So let me share three powerful truths with you today. The first truth is this. In the beginning... Before the world was ever created, there was already a relationship. Before Adam and Eve were here, there was already a relationship. This is the Holy Trinity. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me show you. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, New Living Translation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and the darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the surface of the waters. John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created, listen to this, everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. Now, you may be asking, who is him? John chapter 1, verse 14 gives us this answer. So the word became human. The word became flesh. And he made his home among us. And he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. This is Jesus Christ, the Son. And Jesus said, in John chapter 10, verse 30, the Father and I are one. So before the world was created, the Holy Trinity already existed. And this is the holy relationship above all relationships. Now, as a pastor, I do get asked this a lot. Can you explain the Trinity? Can you help me understand how that works? And so I want to read this definition to you. I do wish I had that Morgan Freeman voice to sound more profound, to give you like a life-changing revelation here, but I'm going to do the best I can, all right? But the Trinity is one God. The Trinity is one God who eternally exists as three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who are fully and equally God in eternal reality with each other. Now, for some of y'all, that's like, like, I kind of grasped that. Like one God, I know just one God, but three distinct personalities or characteristics, and, and, and I'm just trying to understand it. And for some people, it's just like, woo, like straight over your head. The Holy Trinity is amazing to me because what it does is tell us that we serve an almighty, powerful God. His authority is so great, it's hard to fathom. It's really hard to comprehend in the reality that we live in today. Three, yet one. And what I love about this, this means that no matter what you're going through today, God could perform a miracle that's beyond your comprehension. And it doesn't matter what you're seeing. God, I want you to do this, but, and God's like, what are you butting about? What is it that's holding you back? Do you not understand that my ways are bigger than yours? What I can do, I can move mountains. I can take down giants. God's ways are beyond our comprehension. And it's amazing. You understand that's a revelation, though. Like, what I'm telling you is live it out. There's a difference between knowing and living it. 
And when you live this out, you're able to take on the trials of life and understand that God is with you and he can still perform a miracle today. There was a relationship before the world was ever created. The second truth is this. God wants you to have a relationship with him. I get it. If you grew up in church, you always heard God loves you. He wants you to know him. But I want you to just sit back for a second and think of this. Because God didn't have to create us to need a relationship with him. He could have created us as mindless robots doing whatever he told us to do. But what does he want from you? He wants your heart. And you cannot worship the Lord with everything you got without having a true relationship with him. So isn't it that amazing? It's amazing. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us, the Trinity, make human beings in our image to be like us. And let me tell you something. This scripture does not mean that we become God's. People have taken this passage of scripture and they have twisted it. And they said, well, this means that we become a God. That is a lie from the devil. That is the same lie that he used against Eve in the Garden of Eden, that you can be like God, you can be God. This does not mean we become gods, but it means that we are created in the image of God. We have the characteristics of God. And we we see that in our everyday lives. We can create, we can bless, we can forgive, and we can love. These are all the characteristics of God because they're created in his image. And we see that authority that we have even over the animals on this earth because God has given us that authority. In verse 26, God said they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth. Here's what I want you to understand. The most important relationship you can have is with God. The most important relationship you can have is with God because this is the first relationship established for human beings. It is. And you will notice in your life that all your other relationships can fall apart easily if God is not in the center. You know why? Because God's going to put you in check. (laughs) And we say hallelujah, but in the moment, it's kind of like, ah, can you be a little bit less? Like, come on. Like, I just want to say something. And God's like, no, no, it's not a time to get back at them. It's a time to forgive and show them my love. But God, I don't want to. But God says, how many times have you ran away from me? And you said some things to me, but I was still there with my open arms, ready for you to come back. See, see God is going to humble you. And, and he makes us selfless right? He allows us, because to have a successful relationship, you also have to sacrifice. You have to sacrifice a lot of things of your wants and your own desires to show love to somebody else. And Jesus showed us that ultimate sacrifice upon the cross. He gave up his life for our mistakes. It's crazy. So the most important relationship you can have is with God, because it's the first relationship ever established for human beings. And I love this because in Matthew, Chapter 22, verses 36 and 37, New Living Translation. A Pharisee was trying to trick Jesus, and he came up to Jesus and said, Hey, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? What is the most important commandment according to the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, listen to this, You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. And what really stood out to me about this, what Jesus is saying, is that he could have worded it like this. You just have to obey God. You just have to serve God. But he went straight towards the relationship part of it. You need to love God. You need to know the Father because he's a good Father who loves you with all of your mind, soul, and heart. That is the greatest commandment is to personally know the Lord. To know God. See that change in your life. You are created for God. So the most important relationship you can have is with God. Now, the third truth is this. And this is kind of funny to me, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. But God designed you and I to need relationships with others. God designed you and I to need relationships with other people. And the reason why this makes me laugh is because this makes introverts terrified. 
Isn't it kind of funny, too, that you see a lot in relationships, there's one extrovert, and then they have a best friend that's introverted, and somehow that always happens, or within a marriage, somebody's really outgoing, talks all the time, and then the spouse is in the back, like, can you come on? I'm ready to go eat. You're always talking to people at church. They don't want another hug. You know what I mean? Like, you see that a lot. And so for an introvert, this is kind of like, you mean I got to talk to people? I don't like talking to people. And, and I get that. You may be busy, but listen, I'm not telling you you need like 500 friends, okay? This isn't Facebook. I'm, I'm telling you that you need at least one person in your life that is always there for you, that can help you, that can hold you up when you feel like you're going through a rough time. Because listen to me, that is a blessing from the Father, And I know our culture has torn that up and made us afraid to be real with people, but that's the enemy. Rebuke it. And trust that the Father will bring somebody in your life, whether a close friend or spouse or somebody who will keep pouring into you today. Now listen to this. How do we know? How do we know that God created us to need a relationship? And I noticed something in the very beginning. As God created, he said something over and over again, that's good. This is good. That's good. Adam, that's good. Then all of a sudden, we see the first that's not good. What was it? It is not. Y'all been reading the Bible lately. (laughs) Y'all pressing me. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Let me tell you something. It is not good for you to do life alone. It's not healthy. I don't care how strong you are, how independent you are. You will go through a hard time, and you need somebody there. You need another believer praying for you, rebuking the enemy for you, helping you and giving and and guiding you through those hard times, especially if you're young, right? Going through high school, and it's, it's difficult. Kids can be really mean, and so you need somebody there pouring into you to keep you going because guess what? You're a light in the darkness, too. You're a big light in the darkness. And what I've seen in my own life, as I got older, all of a sudden those people that used to make fun of me or said, you know, you're a Bible thumper, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden now they're messaging me like, hey, how did you get that? How did you change? God wrecked me. God wrecked me. And he's a good father who loves you. You need people in your life. And sometimes that can be difficult. Sometimes you don't want to tell people what you're going through. But God said it's not good for man to be alone, so I'm going to make a helper who was just right for him. And so what happened? He caused Adam to go to sleep, and out of his rib, he created the first woman, Eve. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the bed. Now, verse 23 makes me laugh. Because if you read, especially within the New Living Translation, he says, at last... Like, in my head, I'm thinking, like, at last I love. Like, just like, I'm, I'm a little wound up today. I don't know if it sounded like that. I'm sure it sounded way better. But you know what I mean? Come on. Come on. He's like, yeah. This is what I'm talking about. You gave me a bunch of furry animals. That was cool. They were comforting. But this right here, Lord, this is what I'm talking about. He said, I'm preaching today. Y'all better tell somebody. Listen, he said, this is bone in my bones. In flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. He was excited. And this means relationships were designed to be a blessing from God. And then what happened after? See, usually this is where the Disney movie ends. There's a reason Disney ends at the wedding or right when they first meet each other, or you see one of those romantic movies, and they're like, oh, they're in love. Just wait five more years, okay? They're going to go through some things. There's some difficulties coming around that they're not going to show you in the movie. What happened? What changed? Listen to me. Temptation happened. And temptation attacked Adam, and temptation attacked Eve. And because they allowed that temptation in their life, listen to me, the relationship status changed. It changed. You remember back in the day on Facebook, you could put, it's complicated? For those that remember that, I don't know, maybe you still can. But it got complicated. It got very complicated. Now listen, why did it get complicated? What is Satan's goal? 
What is the devil's goal when it comes to our relationships? Destroy it? To take it out? Listen, this is how he does it, though. He wants to break you up from God to break up your relationships. And that's why today we see so many people searching for godless relationships. Isn't it funny that the first relationship established was with God to make us healthy, but somehow today in culture, our culture tells you just do what you want, what feels good, and then later have that conversation. Later is too late because then it becomes even more complicated. I have these feelings. I feel like I'm in love. I want to do this. I want to be with this person, but they don't know the Lord. Think I can change them? And people don't think about that. You're talking about growing old with somebody because that's a commitment, right? Talking about having children. Imagine those difficult conversations because ultimately it comes down to this. We want our loved ones in the kingdom of God for all eternity. And so that's going to be a battle and a struggle. But the world tells us just go off of how you feel, emotions, the nightlife. I'll get you in a lot of trouble. And it becomes dangerous very quick. He wants to break you up from God to break up your relationships because guess what happens? As that starts to fail, then you say, I'm going to do life alone. I don't need anybody. I'm going to do me. I'm going to focus on me. Guess what? To the devil, that means you're more vulnerable for an attack because now you're by yourself. You know how easy it is to get into your own head when you're by yourself? To hear those thoughts from the enemy, yet have nobody else there to encourage you to keep going. It could be devastating, but this is what he wants to do. So the title of today's message is this, the breakup. The breakup. What changed? Three dangerous habits started to attack our relationships immediately after the fall. Three dangerous habits. The first deadly habit is this to become guarded, to become very guarded, no longer being open, no longer being real. I'm too afraid to get hurt or what you may do, so I'm just going to keep to myself and hold some things back. And some of you are doing that with the Lord right now. There are things in your life that you still don't trust God with, and you're holding back, and it's devastating you. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 7, what happened after the fall? At that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame of their nakedness. So what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So here's what it's stating, and we've been over this before. But they were so ashamed, guess what? They became guarded with each other. They started to hide things in their own life that they did not want their spouse to see. Listen, this is dangerous to allow temptation to come into your life and hide it from your spouse. Let me say that again. It is very dangerous to allow temptations to come into your life to open up that door and hide it from your spouse. It is very dangerous to have feelings on the inside, things that are attacking you right now, but not being open with the person you love or maybe a family member, you're struggling, you put on that smile, I'm good, I'm in church, but on the inside, you're dying. But the thing is, you're not telling anybody. You're not being real. And, and I get it because I struggled with this for a long time. It was very difficult for me to be open with people because I didn't want the awe. I didn't. I didn't want the pat on the back. But I realized that sometimes God was telling me, you're holding on to pain and hurt and it's going to take you being open to actually heal. For somebody to pour into you. And guess what? They may say something you already know. But it's that love that changes your situation and your heart. And it starts to motivate you to keep going. So it's very dangerous to hide certain things. And so, listen, when the relationship status was perfect, guess what? Nothing was hidden. Nothing was hidden. They showed it all, literally. They showed it all, all right? But as soon as the fall, they started to hide things and cover things up. And then, listen to this. When they started to hide from each other, they started to hide from God. 
Genesis 3, 9 through 11. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? God's not playing games. He already knew. In fact, he already knows where you are right now. He knows what you're going through and what you're dealing with. And the reason he is calling out to you is because his desire is for you to admit where you are right now. To look at your life and look at your situation and say, God, I'm here. I don't know how I got here. I made some bad decisions, but I'm here. Now listen to the wording. Adam replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. See, being guarded from God is dangerous because being guarded quickly leads to being isolated. Like I said, being alone, feeling like nobody loves you. If you say, okay, the church doesn't love me, then God doesn't love me. And you start to have all of these thoughts within who can I trust? And I'll just live for me. But God said, again, it is not good for you to be alone. So my question for you today is this. And I want you to be real and you can write it down. Are you guarded? Are you being guarded? In your relationship? With your spouse? With your family? With your friends? With the church? Are you being guarded right now? And is it because either you're ashamed of your past or because somebody has hurt you? Now listen, I'm going to tell you what God told me. The longer you hold on to this and be guarded, the longer you will hold on to the pain and the hurt and the distrust of anybody else. See, you have to experience healing, and so you have to be open with God about where you are in life right now. And that's powerful because God is saying, where are you? Where are you? I'm here. But I hid from you, God, because I'm embarrassed. And God's going to say, who told you you were an embarrassment? Because that is straight from the enemy. God already knew. Again, he already knew the mistakes and decisions that you would make. He knew the trials that you would go through. And he's calling your name to not only heal you, but to restore you. We're getting too comfortable walking around broken. It's becoming a lifestyle. It needs to change. Your identity is not brokenness. Your identity in Christ should be restored, renewed, stronger than ever. But God wants strong relationships in your life because that is a blessing from the Father. So it's time to be open. When you are guarded with God, you hold on to pain and you shut out the healing. Now, the, the second deadly habit is this. I have a feeling I might get an amen to this one. Blaming others. <laughs> Blaming others. I think it's funny that now in Genesis 3, 12, when they got in trouble, all of a sudden Adam's like, hey, it was the woman you gave me. Before God's like, oh, what about, woohoo, what about all that? Huh? Now it's the woman's fault that she did this. She gave you the fruit, so she made you eat it too, right? She put it in your hand. She must have made you eat it. And then what did Eve do? We've talked about this already. She blames the devil, and again, the devil can't make you do anything. He doesn't have that authority over your life. But in Genesis 3, verse 13, the serpent deceived me. That's why I ate it. So, because he deceived you? You should have already known. Some of you should have already known about the deception. You should have recognized it because the word of God reveals it already. The word of God has revealed every deception, every trick, everything the devil's going to bring against you. You should already know and know what not to do and what to do. It's all your fault that this happened. You know how frustrating it is to deal with somebody who will never own up to their own actions. It's always somebody else's fault. And I get it because nobody likes to be wrong. But listen, at least admit that you are wrong because what I'm telling you today is your attitude, if this is your attitude and you're constantly blaming others for the reason that you're not happy, 
for the reason that you don't have the job you want, for the reason that you're not making the money you want, or for the reason of everything in your life crashing down, you will kill every relationship that comes across you because people feel it. There is a heaviness on you. As soon as you walk into the room, people know, oh, something's going on there. I'm going to pray for them, but from a distance. Attitude will kill your relationship. What does the Bible say about blaming others? Paul does not hold back. In Romans chapter 2, verse 1, New Living Translation, Paul said, You may think you can condemn such people, but Paul said, You are just as bad. You are just as bad. You have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do the very same things. If I was Paul, I would have dropped a mic right there. If I could drop this one, I would. Who was Paul talking to? Paul was writing about all the sins that we all struggle with the sins that we all deal with on a daily basis. But the Jewish readers reading what Paul wrote automatically assumed Paul must be talking to the Gentiles. He ain't talking to the church. The church is perfect. We're all happy and smiling every day, and we get a lot of hugs. Everything's great here. He must be talking to the non-Jews, the Gentiles over there. And Paul's like, wake up. I'm talking to you. It's you. He said, you are just as bad and you have no excuse, which means you are not called to blame others because that's what the devil does. He will condemn. He will say, it's all your fault. You're never going to change. What are we called to do? We are called to be a light in the darkness, a light of hope for those that are struggling, even when it's hard and people may not be your favorite. Romans chapter 13, verse 12, NIV verse. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside, listen, the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, what are the deeds of darkness? If you look at the very next verse, verse 13, you're going to notice that everything that this world says is fun for relationships to do is exactly what this verse says not to do. Because it will kill every relationship that you have. It is an attack on your mind and well-being. Verse 13, don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or sexual promiscuity, immoral living, or quarreling and jealousy. Everything that the world says is fun. This is what a relationship should look like. Go out there, have fun, lose yourself in the middle of the night and... Whatever happens, happens. And we read the Bible. And to be honest, some of us who are struggling with that, we're kind of like, it does feel fun in the moment, God. And what you're saying doesn't really sound fun. Like, what do I do? do I, you know, sometimes when we think of holy, we think of just wearing white robes and singing with harps. Let me, let me, let me be honest with you. Let me tell you what's not fun, being used. Allowing somebody to take advantage over you and allowing a mistake in your life that now you can't take back or hurting someone's feelings because you got jealous of what they had when God was already speaking over your life that you were to have it too. But now because your heart's not ready with the little things, how could you have more? Right? It's not fun. So what does God want to do? He wants to protect you from all of this because when you open the door to these behaviors in your relationships, at the end of it, you're going to want to point the finger to somebody else. But listen, who opened the door? You opened the door. You're allowing these habits in your life to kill your relationship. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Instead, what do we do? Clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what I love about this verse. That means when you're going through a hard time or you want to say something or a temptation is in front of you, what do you do? You run to the Lord. You notice you don't want to do bad things when you're reading his word. 
You notice that you, you don't want to give in to temptation when you start to worship his name. Why? Because when you're in the presence of the Lord, when you clothe yourself in the righteousness of the Lord, the devil is rebuked. And the Bible tells us that no matter what temptation is in front of you, there will always be a way out. God will not allow you to be a slave to the enemy. It won't. He will always give you a way out. So instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not let yourself think about the ways to indulge in evil desires. That's how you get your mind right. Back on track. And it's no wonder that for a lot of us, it's the last thing we want to do. We want to give in to that temptation in that flesh. But again, it will destroy every relationship that comes across your way. When you blame others for your mistakes, you keep making the same mistakes. You have to own up because eventually your friendships, your relationships, and even your marriage, it gets old really quick. Stop blaming other people for the things that you need to change in your own life. The last deadly habit is this. Laziness. Laziness. Here's a hard truth. In the beginning, relationships were perfect. Now they take work. Every relationship takes work. When you see newlyweds, they're like, oh, it's so easy. We just love each other. Ask somebody that's 50 years in. I about killed him five times. <laughs> By the grace of God, we're here today, right? Marriage takes work. Relationships take work. Even with your family, with your parents, with your loved ones, it takes work. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 we, further, we see the first strain on the marriage. For God told Eve, now you will desire to control your husband and he will rule over you. This made me laugh too because some scholars interpret this meaning as meaning a wife will be frustrated with her husband. I think we know that very well. But also it means that there will be conflict over the roles in the family. Over the roles in the family, who is to lead the family and, and what it means to protect and to love, okay? Because it was intended for man to be a leader over the family, to be a protector, because this is an example of Christ over the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, for a husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. But that does not mean for the dad, for the father to come into the house and be like, everybody, do what I tell you to do. I demand this, I demand that. No, Jesus gave up his life for the church. And you're there to lift each other up. And we know how complicated life can be. And sometimes you don't feel like it. You don't feel like having those conversations. So what I'm telling you, you get lazy in the relationship. Guess what? You're going to start to drift apart. Too many people today feel like roommates in the same house when they're married. And that's how it happens. We become lazy. It takes work. And laziness within a relationship, listen, is selfish. Let me show you why. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But those who will not care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied their true faith. Such people are worse than the unbelievers, meaning you know the truth, but you don't care enough to change it. You know what you should do but you're still not doing it because you're being lazy in this area of your life. You don't care to fix it, what God has already brought into your life. It is so easy to go through life and no longer see the blessing that you have. Can I ask why? Why? What's holding you back? If it's busyness, then stop. Have a day to just pause and trust the Lord. I have an example. I told you, everything with this series is weird, okay? So just bear with me. But we have some slime right here. And Miss Autumn has agreed for me to pour it on top of her head. So if that's okay with you guys. <laughs> she has not agreed to that. I told her it could be like the rest series where the, the gift kept getting bigger and bigger. And then eventually we could have like a slime tank or something like that at the end of the series. Now, I want to make a point because here's what I want to tell you, Autumn. In that slime, in that goo, messiness, is something you really want. Hold on, hold on. Something you really want. <laughs> Sorry. 
But here's what I want to tell you. You have to trust my word. So you can take my word and dive into the mess, or you can walk away. What do you want to do? It's like the price is right right now. Like, come on. We need like a wheel. All right, go ahead and dive in. If that's what you choose, dive in. We need one of those little uh, timer things like, uh-oh, uh-oh, what is that? Do you like donuts? Do you like gift cards? Guess what? You get to keep that. She didn't know that. She had no clue what was in this time at all. Um, but let me ask you a question. Because that was in the mass, did it lose its value? It's still valuable today. The reason she dove into the mess is because of the words that I gave her that she trusted. She was committed to finding the value and the goo and the messiness and the slime. And here's what I noticed today about the breakup mentality that the devil puts in our mind. He's trying to get us not to be committed anymore. You know, and I hear people all the time saying, why, why, why do I need a relationship? If I could do life on my own, I just don't care anymore. I don't want to be committed. Commitment is what God values the most. And I'm about to prove that to you. But commitment is valuable. It is by the commitment of God that we know that he loves us, that he will never leave us or forsake us. We all give Autumn a hand. Thank you so much. Again, you get to keep that. Yeah, we'll have more fun with this. I want to show you a couple of things. Let me tell you why God designed us for relationships and not to give up on them. Point one is this. Commitment is what proves God's love for you. Commitment is what proves God's love for you. Earlier, I told you that Jesus said the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Did he end there? No. He made sure to teach you something else. What did he say? In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 40, New Living Translation, Jesus replied, listen, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But he didn't stop. He said a second is equally important. Don't miss this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with everything that you have. And that love will overflow within your own life. And then because of that love for God, you will be able to show love to others even when it's super difficult. What if they don't like me? Be a light. It doesn't mean you have to hang around them all the time, but be a light, be an example of God's word. But listen, this can be hard to do when you feel like you don't love yourself. This can be very difficult to do, to love others when you feel like your life is crashing down and you have nothing going for you. And so this is why commitment is so important. God pursued you first. He reached down into the mess, into the goo, into the stickiness, because he said, you are valuable to me. And he said it to us first, you are valuable to me. I will prove my love to you first. You don't have to do anything. As Jesus was on the cross for our sins, he did that before we decided to repent. First John chapter four, verse 19, New Living Translation. We love each other because he loved us first. And that's strength to keep going, to remember. And maybe for some of you right now, you need to write that down. And you need to keep it in your car or in your house to keep remembering God loved you first even when you were difficult. And maybe you're being difficult right now. The Father's arms are open. 
Again, he didn't have to create us to have a relationship with him. But since the beginning, God has proved this commitment by desiring and wanting a relationship with you, meaning hearing your prayers. The times that you've come in here and you cried and you felt like you had nothing left to give, the time that you prayed over your marriage, the time that you prayed over your relationships, the time that you prayed to keep going, to have the strength. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. I wanna share this truth with you. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things that he has planned for us long ago. Because I know who I am in Christ, because I know that I am somebody new and restored, listen, now read it, I can do good things because the Lord gives me strength because he first was committed to me and he did not break that commitment now because of his love, I can show love to others. Which brings me to my last point, this is good. God wants you to be committed to others. Last point is God wants you to be committed to others, why? Because it takes work to have healthy relationships. Instead of being guarded, you need to be open. Instead of blaming others, we need to admit when we're wrong, when it's time to forgive. Instead of being apathetic, we need to show each other we care. Because that commitment keeps us going. I love Romans chapter 15, verse five and six. Listen to this. May God who gives this patience and encouragement help you, listen, help you live in a complete harmony with each other. God who gives you grace, love, and encouragement helps you to live in harmony with each other. Why? As it is fitting for followers of Christ so that we can all join together and do what? Together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God. You know, because we see it every day right now on the news, on TV, you know the division in our country and the things that we are seeing today. What if the people of God every color stood together and shouted out, God is good, he changed me, this is my brother in Christ, this is my sister in Christ, and we will be a light in the darkness. You know what that does to people? That's repentance, and it brings change. And all of you may join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God. And this is so important because God reminded me of a story. I'll never forget long ago, in Shreveport, Louisiana, we were praying one night and we we're saying, God, just use us, you know, faithful and stuff. And my wife felt like she needed to go into a restaurant and, and pray for a man. And she almost saw like a glimpse of what this man could look like. Here's what I love about the story. She went into a restaurant, he wasn't there. She could have gave up turned around and said, okay, I was completely wrong. Let's just go home. She didn't. She said, okay, well, there's McDonald's over there. Let me try that. See, a lot of times God is going to speak something over your life for you to do, but you may go through trials where it doesn't seem like it's going to work or that it's going to happen. What do you do? Do you give up? Keep moving in faith. Now, here's what happened. She walked into McDonald's, sees a man sitting there, and she goes, that's the man. And she walked up to him. She said, This may be weird, but I feel like God has led me to pray over you. Now, when we've done this before, usually you get a few responses. People will say, okay, no, thank you. Or, okay, in an awkward way, or they'll just walk away. She was expecting one of those responses. The man was almost in tears. And he said to her, you don't know how much this means to me. Why? He said, I'm a pastor. And he had a big family. I can't remember, it was like four kids or five. And he said, right now the church is struggling. My family is struggling. Financially, I'm struggling. And he said, I came into McDonald's by myself to do some work. 
and I'm so frustrated and tired. I said, God, do you even care anymore? Will you just tell me that you care, that you're in my situation? And he said, as he had those thoughts and spoke that to the Lord, it is then that my wife walked up and said, can I pray for you? What did it show that man? At that moment, God proved his commitment of love. That it did not matter the circumstances happening around him or the reality that everything felt like it was crashing down. God was still in the midst. God was still there to bring him out of that. And it's his love, especially through you, through somebody else stepping out on faith. We celebrated Isaiah, went all over the world. I believe God wants to use you here too, in Hickory, at your job, with people you don't know, they don't even like you. But the first relationship ever established was between us and God. And because of his commitment with you, listen, God wants you to be committed to others. Can we just start to rebuke the breakup mentality? Can we rebuke that and say, God, even when it's hard, I'm committed to you. I'm committed to others. And a difference will be made. Can I have you stand up right here? I believe that this is a good start for this series. And we're going to dive deep. It's going to get a lot deeper than this. It's just the beginning. But the most important relationship you can have before you fix your marriage before you fix your dating life. Or maybe right now you're you're single and you're just struggling. God, why am I single? Before you, that's even fixed. Before the family problems are fixed. Listen, you have to have a relationship with God to be the center. God has to be the center of every relationship that you have. And the devil may have come into your life trying to tempt you to walk away from God. And now you're noticing all these relationships are falling apart and you're starting to hide from God. God, I'm just, I'm just afraid. I'm scared. I'm embarrassed. And God says, who called you an embarrassment? For I have called you redeemed and restored. Today, some of you need a fight. It's time to get rid of that brokenness mentality, like I said, and it's time to stand up and fight in the name of Jesus. I will see changes in my life. I will let go of some of these habits. I no longer will be lazy about the relationships that I have. I won't take them for granted anymore. I will do these things for the Lord. I will stop blaming other people and I realize, God, I've made some bad decisions too. I made some mistakes too. I can forgive as they have forgiven me, God. It's time for me to change. I want to ask the pastoral care team to come up front right now. And if that's you today, if you need to pray over your relationship, over your marriage, over a friendship, over your family, or maybe just over your heart, I'm going to ask you to come up front right now. And we're going to sing to the Lord. And this is going to be a time of change. But nobody can make you do it. It's up to you. This is your moment. This is your time. Let us pray for you. Hey guys, it's Pastor Bobby Chandler, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor, before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel, and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. Also, I want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church, because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So, we love our Authentic family. Family, and thank you today for joining us.